So you, we find ourselves tonight in Nehemiah chapter 1. Um, and so let's uh, take the study before the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are truly a, a great and awesome God, Father. And truly, um, you are, um, you and you only you are worthy of our praises, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit, Lord. We thank you for the instruction and the guidance, Father, for the direction, Lord, for the encouragement that comes by reading and understanding and studying your word. And so tonight, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would walk amongst us, Father, that you would fill each of us with your spirit uh, such that we would be able to understand the things that you are speaking to us individually and corporately as a body of believers, Lord. Uh, We do love you. We praise you. I thank you and commend you for these saints that have come to Um, hear of your word, Lord God, and to be instructed by your spirit, I pray, Father, you'd bless him for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah, um, in the chronology um, of things, just to keep things in context, we saw um, through Ezra that beginning in about 538 B.C., Zerubbabel was um, allowed... Uh, by the king of Medes, uh, the kings of the Medes and the Persians, to return to the land. And he brought with him about 50,000 people um, of uh, those that had been held captivity in Babylon. And, of course, the Medes and the Persians had overcome Nebuchadnezzar uh, during that uh, 70 years um, that they had been in captivity. And so Zerubbabel was called by God to bring them back to the land, and he did. He led a group of 50,000. And their first, per, uh, first priority was to reestablish the, the temple and more particularly to reestablish the altar. And they did that and they accomplished it. And, and then, um, as we saw through the study of Ezra, they, um, they uh, lost their focus due to uh, distractions, due to persecution, um, and for a period of time. But ultimately, they did complete the temple. And then... Um, in the latter parts of the book of Ezra, we saw that Ezra had come, and he returned too with a second flight of people, and his, his group was a much smaller, about 3,000 in all, um, but he came to, teach, to the pe- teach the people and remind them of the importance of being holy and the importance of you know, serving God, and so um, that was Ezra's function primarily, and Ezra was a scribe and a um, and he was used by God in that respect and um, to remind the people of their need to be holy and to practice the things that God had instructed them through Moses in the, in the law. Then there's a gap of about 12 years till we get to Nehemiah. Um, and that um, takes us to about 445 B.C., um, which is a very significant time period in, in God's prophecies. And we're going to see that next week. Um, specifically. I really do encourage you to come next week. It is, uh, we're not going to get there tonight. It's uh, uh, too much material, frankly. Uh, but next week, uh, one of God's great um, prophetic, uh, um, well, great prophetic um, truths we'll see in the scripture in chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Um, Daniel's, one of Daniel's specific um, prophecies will come true. Um, and so that is a very encouraging and uh, very exciting uh, part of this book. But in 445 B.C., Nehemiah um, is allowed to return, and his purpose is specifically, and what he asks uh, Artaxerxes is the, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so that occurs, he does get that permission and returns in 445 B.C. Nehemiah had a, um, a ministry that is very, very important for us to study. And um, he is many things. Um, he is a leader. Um, he's a great example of a leader. Um, he is, um, as a leader, he is one who cares, and he cares deeply. He was not, though, a priest, and he was not a prophet. He was not um, anyone unique or um, in the respect of his skills and the things that uh, God had allowed him to um, to be equipped with, but he was a leader. Um, and so as a result, we see the book of Nehemiah frequently taught as a book on leadership, and it is a great um, book in that regard. It's really important for us to understand and to see the, the, um, the instruction of God as uh, 
the faithfulness of Nehemiah um, to the call that God has in his life to complete it is really important. And so he was untrained um, in the things that God would call him to do, but he was available and he was faithful to the things of those things. And it is, it's uh, not only was he faithful to begin those things, but he was faithful to complete them. For many of us in our lives, the things that God has called us to do, you know, we get around to them and ultimately we, we set out about them, but we, we quit. And that's a failure, really. We quit too soon. Or we stop due to persecution, much like we saw what happened with uh, Zerubbabel and the people. We, we allow those distractions to come in our lives and to um, uh, basically take us away or divert us from the things that God would have us to do. And, and yet it is so important that we, like Nehemiah, focus on the things that God has us to do and despite persecution, despite those that would dissuade and discourage us, that we continue on and we complete the things that God has called us. And Nehemiah is that great example for us. And again, um, he, um, he just um, is a great leader. He was a contemporary, obviously, of Ezra. We'll see Ezra has a part in this book. And he was also a contemporary of the prophet Malachi. So um, with that... Oh, the outline, I guess you would say, the outline is uh, chapters 1 through 6. We'll see the, the work that he goes through to reconstruct the walls. We will also see in those chapters as well um, as in other places um, of the book or later in the book, the, the devices of our enemy and the tricks and the things that he uses to dissuade and discourage people from completing those things. They're all on display in Nehemiah. So as we go through these, we'll highlight them um, and see them um, particularly. So 1 through 6, chapters 1 through 6 are about reconstructing the walls. Again, something that God had called Nehemiah to do. Chapters 7 through 13 are the, essentially the reinstruction of God's people and the things of God that they should be about. The, um, there was something else that faded through my mind, but um, maybe it'll come back as we st uh, go through these scriptures. So let's get started. Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. Again, the time period is 445, 445 years before Christ. Chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So this gets us started um, in this account. And as it says here in uh, verse 1, that Nehemiah, distinguished from other Nehemiahs that we might find in the scripture, is the son of Hakaliah. Um, it came to pass in the month of Chislev. Chislev is November and December of the year of what we know of our calendar. And it's important that, um, you know, uh, well... All of God's word is important, but it's uh, the more you study it, the more you recognize that there is no, um, God's just not trying to fill up space with the words that he writes, and by his Holy Spirit is he, um, he does these things. There is nothing that is um, arbitrary or capricious about God's word, and so these things, when God gives us this instruction and we see that he, he says to us that this, this occurred in the month of Chislev, um, which again is November, December. That's important for us, and it's important for good reasons, and we'll see that um, here in this chapter. And essentially, it gives us the time period and the date of which it occurred. And those dates, as I mentioned earlier, are really important to know and to understand, not only for today's lessons, but for next week's as well. So the month of Chislev, November, December, and it came to pass that um, his brother, literally, Hananiah, Hanani, excuse me, one of my brethren came with uh, men from Judah. 
understand that from, uh, he says here he's in Sushan, and Susan to J Jerusalem or to, for, to Judah was a thousand mile journey. These guys had just walked from Glacier National Park to Minden, Nevada, right? It is a long journey. It's a big hike. Um, it was no trivial thing that they had come a thousand miles. Um, and he asked, though, and this is important to see in the heart of Nehemiah, he asked him and he says, um, and I asked him concerning the Jews who had escaped who and survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. So there are, I think, and see in here, three groups of people he's concerned with. He's concerned with those where he refers to them as who had escaped. Those that had, um, in reality, had accompanied either Zerubbabel, the 50,000, or Ezra, the 3,000, and had returned to Jerusalem with the permission of the king. That's one group he was concerned with. The second group that he was concerned with was a group that had survived the captivity, who Nebuchadnezzar had actually left behind in Babel, or excuse me, in Judah at the destruction of Jerusalem. And that group of people um, in 586 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar had uh, finally destroyed the city, um, he'd come and put it under siege for the third time. He was truly irritated with the Jews that he had to come back and do it yet again, and he, I mean, he dismantled the city, as we saw um, in the earlier, chat, or earlier books that we studied. I mean, he, he destroyed it. He utterly destroyed Jerusalem, brick by brick, block by block. He burned it down. Um, he was uh, literally uh, ticked, um, using today's vernacular, when he had to come back a third time. So that, but that is the second group of people he's concerned about. But those that survived the captivity, that who had left behind and for 70 years now had been there trying to exist in that land with very little spiritual leadership, if any, um, and just living off the, you know, amongst the wild beasts and the, the other raiders that no doubt had inhabited the land at the time. And then his third concern was concerning Jerusalem, the city itself. God's city, God's appointed city, he was concerned with. And this, I think, gives us um, an understanding and an appreciation of um, one aspect of being a leader. To be a leader, you got to care, right? And he cared deeply. He was concerned for these people. And he, I, I sense in, uh, in this, as you go through and you study this book, that you know, he was anticipating his brother's return, his, his brother coming from Judah and giving him this report or having a report to give. And he was anxious to see him. And, and the reason was is he cared. He cared deeply about God. He cared deeply about God's chosen city, Jerusalem. And most importantly, he cared about God's people and how they were faring. And this is a burden that God had put on his heart. And and um, God would work mightily through Nehemiah because he cared. And I think it is virtually impossible to be a leader and not care, right? You cannot be a leader in your home if you don't care about your kids. You can't be a leader in your home if you don't care about your spouse, right? You can't be a leader at your work if you don't care about um, getting things done and accomplishing the things that are there. And so... He cared, and he cared deeply, as we'll see. But he, he was concerned about those, those three things. And the report he got had to be um, very um, discouraging. They said to me, they, um, the survivors who are left, be, uh, are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach, Right? They, they're struggling. They're struggling to maintain. It is, a, again, a, a city that's devoid of any spiritual leadership. It's a city that is, has been left in ruin. It's 140 years since Babylon now had been, um, um, had destroyed it. Certainly the temple was standing again and had been for a few years, but you can see the heart of... of um, Nehemiah and his desire to know just how the people are doing. Okay, the, the temple's back up. It had been for a few years. How are the people doing? And they're in great distress and reproach. 
And then also the wall of Jerusalem is also broken and the gates are burned with fire. Literally for 140 years, the walls had stood, or excuse me, had uh, been tipped over and pushed over and were laying on the ground and nobody had done anything about it. And understand the significance of a wall in that period of time. A walled city was one where you could go in and you would have um, protection and separation from the outside, right? It was a place of refuge. You could come inside and be protected. And, and it was, when we think of walls, this is not like a fence um, or a stone wall you might see in the uh, landscape of Scotland or Ireland today where they use stone because there's so much of it. Could use it in the ranchos too, by the way, um, to, to build fences. And that's not the type of walls we're talking about. These walls were big, massive walls. Um, if you have been to Jerusalem, there's a portion of um, Nehemiah's walls that are still standing, and you can see them. And literally, they are eight plus feet high, eight plus feet wide, and 20 some feet long. Um, it was, these walls are incredible. And they were, um, um, they were all tipped over, and, uh, and they were of no use at this particular time because the walls had been torn down by um, Nebuchadnezzar. So the people had no protection. And the people, no doubt, lived in fear for marauders, for raiders, for those that would come and, and steal from them. And that was true. The neighboring countries, as they would plant a crop and, and they would, um, it would come to harvest time, that the, the uh, neighboring countries, those enemies of the Jews, would come in and just take their crops and run off with them. And so it had to be just terribly difficult times to live in. And here we see uh, Nehemiah's heart where he says there, um, and, and so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. There's a, a saying in America that you hear from time to time, used to hear, it seems that you used to hear it more and more is, you know, real men don't cry. Nehemiah cried. He wept over the city. He didn't weep because of some physical ailment in, in his body. Um, he wept for the things of God. He wept for those people and the circumstances they were in. God had impressed upon his heart you know, this, this care for them, and he wept for God's, to recognize that God's city of Jerusalem still stood in ruins and was not being effective and used for the protection and the separation of God's people. And he sat and he wept and he mourned for many days, it says, and he was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, and he finally he breaks into a prayer um, well, actually, let me read uh, a portion of Psalm 137.5. Actually, I'll turn there real quick. You can, too, if you're um, it's just a little bit to the right. 137 uh, in Psalms says, um, starting in verse 4, it says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Now, again, this is written by someone. Um, the author is not noted, at least in my uh, Bible. Um, that they were the, this was the children of Israel while they were in captivity in Babylon. And the, earlier in this chapter, as you continue to turn there, just as some background, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, and yeah, we wept when we remembered Zion, when we remembered the land of God. We hung our, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For those, or excuse me, for there, those who carried us away captive asked us, for a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And verse 4, it says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. And if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my, uh, my chief joy, Verse 7, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. 
but the, the people of, that were held in captivity at this particular time in Babylon, um, you know, they, it was an indignation to them. It was suffering. It was hard on them. And they were mocked and asked to sing songs. And the writer of the psalm says, you know, um, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Right? These, this heart that pe- they had for uh, God's chosen city is um, definitely um, something near and dear to the people of, um, who were held in captivity. In verse 5 it says, And I pray, um, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, The word that you commanded your servants Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray... Please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to prayer of your servants who desire to uh, fear your name and let your servant prosper this day and pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So here we have this uh, tremendous prayer of uh, Nehemiah. This is the first of 12 that we're going to see. Nehemiah, while he was a a leader and while he was a God-fearing man, he was also a man of prayer. We're going to see that he's a man of action, but first, he was a man of prayer. And there's much, um, much that we can learn from that. He, he was faithful, and he understood God's word. And the only way you can understand God's word and pray these types of prayers is if you spend time in God's word. Nehemiah... Um, Nehemiah chapter 9 is a classic prayer. Then there's, uh, there's three, ch- three chapter 9s in the Old Testament that you do well to remember. And you go do well to look at the prayers those, that are offered in those chapters. And there are cha- Daniel chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, and Nehemiah chapter 9. Um, easy to remember um, that there are those chapters that are just tremendous prayers. We see an inkling of it in tonight's, the prayer he offers here. Um, But in those particular chapters, as we get to them, um, we'll spend a a little bit of extra time in understanding just the heart of those things. But those three significant prayers in those three chapters are truly incredible. That's just kind of an extra credit thing. But tonight, see his prayer here. First he calls out, he says, um, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. So first thing he does, and I, and I love this approach to prayer. He acknowledges and he reminds, uh, um, certainly he's reminding God, but I think more so, at least when I pray in this fashion, I'm reminding myself as to who I am praying to. He is praying to the God of heaven, right? The creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is within him. There is... Uh, um, he, he found it all. He designed it all. We learn from Genesis that he, he called it into existence. All of that we know and we see, that we can feel and we can touch, God called it into existence from nothing. And that is, a, that is who the God we serve is. Nehemiah understand that. And he said, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, And he is great and awesome. There is nothing too hard for him. He is is that. He is um, is just, we should be in awe of him in all we do 
in all we say to approach the God of heaven as creator of all, all that there is, all that we would ever know it is an incredible thing. And then I love this next um, sentence. He says, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commands, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servants. Right? You who keep your covenants and commands. So he's praying to God and in this second part of it, he, he acknowledges that God is one who keeps his covenants. He keeps his promises. He is faithful and he is trustworthy. And he reminds, he knows this, and he just reminds us as he's praying this, and, and it is a good reminder because God is those things. He is faithful to his covenants. He is faithful to his promises that he's given us. And as we know and study God's word and we see his promises, maybe you have a, a devotional that talks about the promises of God, or you have, you have favorite ones that you've posted maybe in the refrigerator or, um, or elsewhere that uh, as just reminders of you know, the promises of God. You can pray those promises. That is what essentially what Nehemiah is doing right here. He's praying on one of the promises or a couple of the promises that God had made to Moses. And he knows God's word well enough that he can, he can cite it, and he does. He's praying literally out of um, Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus here about this particular promise with that you who keep your covenant and, and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Then he says, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant. Not that he has ears and eyes, but you know, physical ears and eyes as you, know, you and I understand him, but that God hears our prayers. And then he continues that he prayed, uh, that I pray before you now day and night. And who is he praying for? Not himself, per se. He's praying for the children of Israel, your servants. And then um, he says, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned, sinned against you. And I love this about him as a leader. Is he does not say, and he does not post or cast blame or anything like that. He acknowledges that the, these are the sins that we have committed against you. We and our forefathers have committed against you. It's not just them or our forefathers who were idiots, which they were. He, can, he owns that. He recognizes it and he confesses it. Um, hey, we have sinned. We collectively as a group have sinned. And we need you. We need you to be faithful to your covenants and to your mercies that you have um, provided us through the law, the Levitical books of Moses. We have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. Again, he takes that ownership, and I think it's important that we understand that. A true leader, he's not one to cast dispersions on his people, but he is one to own it, accept it, and then to beseech God to hear his prayers. He continues there in, in the next verse, in verse 7, he says, we have acted very corruptly against you and not kept the commandments. Not them, but we have. The statutes nor the ordinance which you commanded your servant Moses. In verse 8, remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. God's faithful to keep his promises, and he did just that. He scattered amongst the nations. Some went to Assyria, the, the northern ten tribes. They were taken captive in Assyria for a time being. Uh, Judah and Benjamin ultimately were taken captive by the Babylonians. The Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and assembled their prisoners with uh, prisoners from Judah. Um, but God did scatter them all over. He was faithful to that promise. If you you're, um, you fail to do these things, that uh, if you are unfaithful, God said, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as, my, uh, for the, as a dwelling for my name, literally Jerusalem. But, again, I, um, when I find these, uh, these great buts, I, 
um, I try to be, uh, try to be um, consistent and circle them because it is that great conjunction word, right? It changes everything. Right? If you, if you are unfaithful, then I'm going to scatter you out. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, some of you, uh, excuse me, yet I will gather them from um, there and bring them to the place which I have chosen for my dwelling, as a dwelling for my name. So God is, he had made that promise to Moses again in Leviticus and, and again in Deuteronomy. And um, Nehemiah here is faithful to, to make that prayer and to remind God as if he needed to. You know, there's no reminding that we need to do of God. God is aware of those things, but he calls out to God and asks God to remember those things. More for, I believe, for Nehemiah than for God, but nonetheless important. As we find ourselves in difficult places um, and we, are, uh, we cry out to God in our prayers, um, which he desires to hear from us, call out. Call out to him. Remind him of the promises in his scripture. God is faithful to those things. He promises that if you will confess your sins before him and by faith put your trust in, in Christ, that he is going to be faithful and that you will be saved. Right? That is a great promise and one that each of us need to make or need to call upon um, to be saved in this world is that faithful promise of God that if we be uh, faithful to confess our sins and by faith believe in his son Jesus Christ, then he will forgive our sins and we will be saved for eternity. Just one of the many great promises of God, perhaps the most important one in our, at, in our lives in the, um, this time period of the New Testament. Verse 10, now these are your servants. He, again, continuing on Nehemiah's prayer. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Again, reminding them of um, God's uh, pulling them out of, um, out of Egypt, out of the world, how he provided for them for 40 years in the desert, how he brought them into the land. These are the ones that you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. And I pray, please, let your ear be attended to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And then, and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. This man is Artaxerxes Longamus, who was the ruler of the, the Persian army, or Persian uh, of Persia at that particular time. And so he is praying, and, and I believe um, from reading this that you know, he heard the, the report of his brother Hanani. He learned of the situation and the, uh, the conditions of the people in Jerusalem, those that had um, survived the captivity and were in the land, as well as those that had returned to the land. And he began, he uh, began praying. He began, uh, certainly he was weeping and mourning, it says, for many days. But I believe what he was weeping and mourning about was what could, would God have him do to, um, to further God's purposes, to restore the walls, you know, to learn that the city walls were still torn down and recognize what it, that meant to the people that they left or lived day by day in fear of being um, ransacked, in fear of being invaded. And so his heart was that, and I believe his prayers for that period of time was, what, Lord, would you have me to do? And he concludes his prayer here. He says, and, uh, and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And I believe he had purposed in his heart that he was going to go to his ruler, right, the, who was the king, and we're going to see here in just a minute, and to ask him for permission to go and, uh, and to help. So, and it says there in the last verse of chapter one, he says, for... I was the king's cupbearer. He was a man of significance in, in Persia at this time. Sushan, as we saw where he was at when this, he got this report from his brother, um, was uh, basically the summer, or excuse me, the winter 
um, capital or the winter, um, oh, um, shoot, lost the word, um, the winter palace for um, the Medes at that particular time, or excuse me, the Persians at that time. And so that's where they were. They were in Iraq. Um, and he was there with him as being the cupbearer. He was a, a very much a trusted um, uh, servant. He was, uh, had the king's confidence. He was the one as the cupbearer who would taste the food each night and he would drink the wine each night. In that particular time, I imagine that the kings of Persia had access to a lot of wine. And so it was his job just to taste it and make sure that nobody was trying or attempting to poison the king, the ruler. And so he, again, he was in a very um, uh, important um, position. He was, he was trusted and he, acts, he had access to the king daily. Something that very few people had and enjoyed. He was that, again, that trusted advisor to the king. And while he was that, he was also a slave. He was a Jew, right? He had been part of those that had come in captivity, and God had raised him up to this position where he had access to the king, much like he had done for Daniel, right? Daniel enjoyed a great position as well. And he was, um, he was uh, by God's um, ordination, he was in a very high place and trusted by the rulers, by Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar's um, ultimately his grandson. But now here we find that Nehemiah is in that place also. And so he is praying here, let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So he is, I think, purposed in his heart what he would like to do. He has now made his prayer. Um, it is the month of November and December. Uh, there's a time period that elapses as he's doing this. And, um, and again, he's, uh, he has um, asked the Lord for that mercy, grant him mercy in the sight of this man who was Artaxerxes uh, Longamus. Chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in the, in the presence before, Therefore the king said to me, Why are, is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So now, notice again, the month has accelerated to um, the fourth month or the fifth month, which is the month of um, Nisan, which is our um, March and April. Four months go by that he's been praying, that he's been seeking God, that he... There was a time period where he was fasting and praying. And now comes this time period here in chapter 2, verse 1, where he comes into the king, right? In the month of Nisan, 20th year, same year, four months later, before King Artaxerxes Longamus, where wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. And I'd never been sad in his presence before. And it would be a horrible thing to be sad in the presence of the king the world ruling emperor at that time, right? It would be un intolerable. Why is a trusted advisor, one who is serving in the highest um, place, this would be like serving in the White House, in the Oval Office, being that person who um, had tasted the wine before the president received it in our country, except for that time, um, he would be the... Uh, he, or, excuse me, Nehemiah was serving the world ruling emperor at the time. And to come in with a sad countenance and a sad face would not be acceptable. And he so much as acknowledges it here. He says, I'd never been sad before him because if you're sad, something's wrong. And how could anything be wrong when you're serving the highest ranking official, the highest ranking king in the world at that time? It couldn't be. You had to be um, upbeat. You had to be um, put your best face on and come in, no matter the circumstances, and um, or at the potential that you would be dismissed and uh, fired, or worse yet, you'd be your life would be required of you because the king might perceive that something was up. So he had never been sad before him 
uh, before that time. And why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but a, a sorrow of heart. Give credit to the king that he recognized the heart of uh, Nehemiah. So I became dreadfully afraid, it says there in the next verse, and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are buried with fire, or burned with fire, excuse me. And so he, he um, very carefully points out to the king, carefully in the sense that he doesn't say the city's name, he just says, he uh, uses there um, that he should not be said when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lie waste in its case be burned with fire. Why shouldn't I be sad when I've learned of that? But he first, and he starts out there and uh, he uh, points out that may the king live forever. There is nothing I hold against you, king. Nothing I, I nothing ill, no ill will here. Um, but he was dreadfully afraid. And he recognized whose presence he was in that that king could call for his life at that particular moment. But he had prayed. He had spent four months praying and seeking God for this direction. And so, so it was. Then the king said to me, what do you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven. And I, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's, tombs that I may rebuild it. And so he noticed there his, he offers this quick prayer, right? So I prayed to God of heaven. That's that quick prayer that you might say in your, in your mind or in your heart when you're confronted with a situation and you just recognize in your spirit your need for God and you call out to him, God, give me the words to say. God, speak to me or speak through me now. He doesn't offer it verbally in the presence of the king, but in his heart and his mind, he is praying. And I prayed to God to heaven. And I, then he acknowledged and he makes the request to the king. And he is very careful here because you don't tell the king what you're going to do, right? The people in my office, they tell me when they're going to take uh, vacations. But you don't tell the king of the, the uh world ruling empire at that particular time when you're going to decide you're going to take a vacation. You, you ask, may it please the king, right? Um, it's a foreign concept in my office. But uh, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight of my brother's tombs, or excuse me, may I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So God had purposed in Nehemiah's heart at this particular time, what exactly he would have him to do. And that would be to rebuild the walls, rebuild Jerusalem. And he comes and he seeks the king's favor to, to go and do that. And we're going to stop there tonight um, because I, there's uh, a lot to, to cover in the next several verses of which we don't have time tonight. It would be doing it injustice to do otherwise. There's a hand up waving in the air. She's in prayer. Oh, I, maybe it isn't. Yeah, Sunday is. Uh, uh, I think Monday is Nevada Day. Yeah, um, Joey. Unless you tell me otherwise. Okay, no. So that, that is a misprint. Thank you. We will be meeting next um, next Sunday night, and it is a great one. I promise you, it, it is. Uh, not anything to do with me, but God's word where we are is uh, really, really um, important prophetically. Nehemiah, again, uh, just, um, just as a, um, as a reminder and to conclude, conclude that he, um, just a faithful leader, God who cared deep, a man who cared deeply um, for the people of God. Uh, he cared deeply for God's city. And we're going to see that as a cupbearer, he, um, he was not equipped to do this, right? As a cupbearer, somebody who would come and he would serve the king, he was not the, 
He wasn't a mason. He wasn't a carpenter. He had no skills, per se, to build the wall. Right? He had no formal training, but yet that is who God uses. That is who God uses then, and that is who God uses now. Right? There is a... God cares more. There's a great quote, um, and I do not know who said it first, but it has been repeated numerous times. Um, oh, shoot. Where did I, I wrote it down. The quote is, God is not concerned with our ability, but our availability. And that is, um, that is so important to understand. That there's, there's not a pastor in the Calvary Chapel movement that is qualified to be used of God as has been done, right? None of us are. It is, it is God's work. And, there's, uh, and it, the only success that has occurred in the Calvary Chapel movement, or frankly in any church, um, has been by God's hand, right? It's not because of the great ability of the man or uh, the great uh, location that they are. It is by their making themselves available for God's purpose. And that is our calling, is um, to be available, seek God, to do whatever he would do. And I believe that's where we find uh, Nehemiah in those four months, as he was seeking God of what God would have him do. He was making, rendering himself available and praying and waiting on God uh, for that purpose and confirmation as to what he was to do. And so... Um, it's important that we understand that, that again, God is not concerned with our ability, but our availability. And then, as always is the case, then God gets the glory. When he uses those people who are ill-equipped and um, unprepared and untrained um, to do great and awesome things for his kingdom, it is God that gets the glory, and that is the most important thing. It is God who worketh within us to do his will. Um, in his purpose. So um, I'll close there, Joey, if you come close us in song. Heavenly Father, Lord God, um, we do praise you and thank you for your word. We thank you too, Father, for your Holy Spirit and the, and the work that you do in each of our lives. And Father, as, um, as Nehemiah had rendered himself, Lord, available for your purposes, that he had sought and waited on you uh, for your direction in his life, Father, I pray that that each of us would be marked by those characteristics as well, Lord, that we would be faithful to be men and women of prayer first and foremost, men and women of action next, Lord, as you would lead and guide and direct us, Father, but that we would wait on you for your direction, that we would not jump ahead, um, Lord, of you and get um, out in front of you and your timing. So, Lord, we, um, we desire to be those people that are available, that are purposeful in our hearts and our minds for the things of you, um, Lord, and that you would find a way, despite our infirmities, despite our uh, limitations, Lord God, that you would find a way to use each of us for your great purposes and glory. Lord, we do love you and praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.